But um, like, you know, you're when you come with parents and you're young, parents always want you to be how they were. But you know, even you, me being a parent now, I have to learn to accept that this is about how my children are and I can't live my, my life for them. I think it was this um, poet called Khalil Gibran, uh, Lebanese, I think he is, he said, your children are not your children, they're the gift. So, you know, like, we are a gift of our parents and our children are a gift of us. So we want to go out at night and they think you should go to bed and stuff like that. So they like be like four of us used to go around. There was five of us. Then one of us, one of them drifted away, go to do other things. But then there was four of us left. So they always come, like my friend come from St. Thomas and my mother didn't like her. And you know, we have loads of little prejudices because she got short hair. And my mother used to say, I don't picky and rose. <laughs> They are called Carly Finko, that picky and rich, <laughs> she called him up. She was good and she was whistling. And so I knew it's my time to get ready. So I have to wait till I, when my mom's gone to bed. And I kind of look on the door, see if she fall asleep, then I'd get dressed. So well, I would lay down in the bed dressed, you know, ready to go out, just kind of just waiting for the light to go out. So this night now I've got my shoes, because you can't go down, you know, them clickets there. Go and gun down the stairs, put your shoes under your arm and step out, click the door. It's nice. And then go through. Then it's snowing outside. And even like, I didn't even trust to put my shoes on until I get around the corner. So I'm walking on that cold ice and going to meet my friend on the corner. And we haven't gone to party. She said, are you going to get out? I said, oh, my mom's gone to sleep. She said, oh, all right. No, let's go. We've gone down to party. Must have buzzed in about, about four, four parties before the night started and I'm coming home. And like the, the landlord lived downstairs and um, I didn't really know that he was up or he even noticed that I came went through the door because I did, we learn, you learn quite quickly how to do things for your benefit. We learn how to take the latch off the thing without the door slamming and stuff, you know, all kind of little tricks. We'll do it in the daytime to make sure it works. So when you're going out at night, you know it's going to work and they're not going to catch you, yeah? When I come back now in the night, doing it real feeling sweet, and I switch the light on, oh my. Just as I put my hand on the light to switch the light on, Mr. Miller come and put his cold hands on my hands. He said, he think me never wait for you coming tonight. I screamed. My interest started as a very young person in music and Jamaican reggae music. I, you know, I used to listen to the radio and hear all the early days pop music from Cilla Black, the Beatles, you know, some American artists back in the days that they used to play on the radio. But when, when our family came from Jamaica and we grew up, we were born and grew up into it, we were hearing all this different type of reggae music you know some call it ska some call it blue beat it was all different eras so it changed and the name changed as it went along um my father used to keep you know house parties during the bank holiday periods like easter time people were off from work and you know we, 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 going to a pub wasn't our thing back in them days because you know it, it was there was a lot of racism around so you know they used to have a lot of problems trying to share the pubs around the city so what happened is we started to keep our own house parties which um after a while developed into the blues party but in the back in the days let's go back to the days it was known as the house party it would start around seven o'clock in the evening, eight o'clock, long before the pub hours was over. But what would happen, you know, I'm, I'm there thinking, why is this guy pushing all these big wardrobe things into this house? And why is dad round the kitchen stacking drinks, crates, you know, baby sham, cherry bee, guineas, you know, long life. Those were the beers and the stuff I saw in them days. Wooden crates stacked from the floor to the ceiling. And my mum's got this enormous pot on the fire. And it smells so delicious because I know it's curry goat because we, we have it sometimes in, in our cuisines when she used to do our dinners and stuff. And um, 
I'm wondering why is this guy putting this big metal box with all these lights on it in the house? Why are the rooms emptied on the ground floor and the furnitures of winter? Anyway, it went on and then the music would start up, you know, the music man would, and uh, I'd hear this, you know, not normal radiogram type of music, but this heavy, dropping, blasting, powerful sounding thing, punching the music, they're making them sound different. Um, going up to probably 9, 30, 10 o'clock, you know, guys and their girlfriends would start coming in, walking in with their glasses on, dark glasses and their suits, you know, looking well sharp and spruce. The ladies just the same. Uh, this was my first reckoning of the house party and understanding what was going on after a few times it had happened. It's something that um, I enjoyed because me and my brother Ruben, we used to sit at the top of the stairs in the early hours watching the people come in. Mum and Dad would be saying, it's time for your beds, guys, time for your beds. And I'm thinking, I'm going to sleep with, with all this. But it was fun, you know. Um, we'd sit there at the top of the step and we'd both fall asleep like this, heads together. And we'd just feel somebody pick us up like that. And the next thing we'd be in bed and we'd wake up the next morning. The party would be over. Um, a couple of the, uh, my dad's friends and himself would be cleaning the rooms out, getting rid of the empty cans and disinfectant in the room back and moving stuff back in and that was it that was the blues party what we came from from the house party to the blues party but he had like a good sound system and because there was nothing else it was like the best because you don't have anything else to compare but when Clifton came on the scene now it was a big following of young people middle people, whatever people, but he carried the sway for a long, long time. And when you go to his party, it was like ram party. You're coming from club and everybody said, boy, me, I got Clifton, you know, can't just say things are going, big things are going down there. So everybody dress up now and we got Clifton party. And Clifton is a bad man, you know. Uh, you know, Clifton is a bad man, you know. People going to other people's parties and fight. Nah, you can't fight because him and his brother, they would just lift them and put them outside. You know, nobody can fight in Clifton's parties. But he, was, he had a really good following of people. And his party was always a ramp pack. I'm telling you, even people outside standing up, they can't go in because it's so packed. But the music as well was that good that people would be dancing outside even because like, they can't get into the house. Because remember, didn't they, they remember our halls and then fancy something like now people want big time community centre to keep parties. It was always in the houses. So you know like people have one room and then you have the passageway and stuff like that and you can only dance in there. Then you have the people who live on top where they might come down and say, we don't tap your nice now. We don't think I don't want people have to work on <laughs> work. We don't have to make never call police and all them kind of thing there. But then but the funny thing about the police as well, right? Them come and they eat off your curry goat and so <laughs> and then confiscate the drink. And I just think they go down to the guild hall and they just get high while you drink and something. So, you know what I mean? But they just come and they say, turn down the sound or turn the music down. Then the, these big fat ladies would give them some curry goat hot, you know, with pepper. And they're not used to the pepper, they turn red and dead. <laughs> These big fat women now would take off the police and put money in and wind up on them and things like that. It used to be fun because like, while they're doing that, you just enjoying yourself, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, man, <laughs> they were good days, really good days, yeah. Um, many years ago, um, I got my, my first house and I needed to furnish this house. So I decided I'd have to have a series of blues parties and um, unfortunately, one bank holiday weekend um, when I planned to have one of the, f the final blueses weekend. Um, I got home and um, couldn't get into my house. Council put a big old padlock through the, the letterbox and notice on the door. So I'd gone down to the council office and said, look, I'm not leaving here with my children until you let me in my property. 
and eventually I got back in my house and decided I'm still going to have the blues anyway. And I, the house was empty um, and I was living in, in one room and, and obviously the kids weren't there. Um, and I'd gone to bed, you know, because I could sleep through anything. I, I think we'd done like eight weeks and I was tired. I'd gone to bed and then I heard singing and I got out of bed and me being me, you know, my head's wrapped up and I think I had on leggings and a vest top, come downstairs, walked into the living room. There's far too many people in this house. And I know that voice. So a friend of mine came up to me, said that the dance at Marcus Garvey had come to an end, there'd been some trouble, um, and Stone Love was playing. And she's like, they're in your house. I've never moved so quick in my life. Ran upstairs to get changed. You, you've never seen anybody get dressed, full hair, tongued, makeup, outfit, to come back downstairs looking trash and ready. So yeah, you know, that, that's a memory I'll always take. You know, it, it stays with me. Yeah. Uh, selector and DJ of Sufferers Hi-Fi and um, proceeded to make our way up to the ranks, you know, um, by challenging other sounds um, to a playoff, or as they call it now, a clash. And um, also getting a chance to play music that I had made personally, to ear the music of me and my band Matumbi on a sound system because sound systems in those days didn't play music that was made by British groups or made in England. They were only interested in um, the wax from Jamaica, right? So um, being knowledgeable about recording studios and recording techniques and being a musician and now becoming a DJ as well, uh, it put me in good stead to kind of have our music aired on the sound system because the sound system was actually black man radio. You know, you, the BBC didn't play records that, that we would go to dances and hear. So the only way that we would get to hear our music would be to go into a blues dance. The first night me hear Lydie Coxon's song. It's not so much the music where I play, no, I'm off tune, everybody don't know. But the first night me and was in a club in town here in Nottingham named the Coleman's, right? It's not so much the music where I did I play. Yes, the music too, but it's the style and pattern where I select an operator, perform the music in a. Festus was a, was a, was a, Jai for just stand up and admire and look at when he play a coxswain sound and a DJ the mic. They call me Blackbeard because I would have a version that was unauthorized of many, many, many tunes, right? And nobody ever knew how I came by them. And I didn't tell anyone. Like, um, for instance, I remember this tune. Um, no for I, you know, you got to know for I, and got to come right over, that tune. I had a bonga man version of that tune, right, that was crazy, but I'd made it myself, you know, and it, it wasn't for release, or I never released any of those tunes, but, and also, um, Promised Land, you know that tune, come take my hand and lead me to the promised land, well, I had a multi-organ version of that tune that I made myself. And in fact, one night while I was playing with Duke Reed, Duke Reed played um, Soul Serenade um, on that tune. Do, 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 right? I said, Duke Reed, where are you? Hear this version here. Raff, I slam on my multi-organ version. The Duke Creed boy them come to me and say, hey, I truly know you were when I mash up your sound, you know. String down and leave the dance. So quite humbly, wrapped up my wires, <laughs> packed up my sound, and was lucky to leave in my life <laughs> for playback a record from Duke Reed in our blues dance. Well, this whole sound system thing started with my dad. And as you know, back in the 60s, 
all them big men of the area at that time all had sound systems. So you had people like Sir Frey, Sir George, Skyrocket, Fugitive, Count Shelley, Sir D, and the name goes on. But all these men were just like, it's like men with their toys. And who could have the biggest sound? So you had people who had sound systems in their house that never could do a party, but or could never play in a hall. So you had the different levels, and then obviously they're in all different areas. So our house, 99 Downs Road, in the 60s used to be a nightclub called the Queen Bee Club. So, it, you know what I mean? And I was born that year. So you find that everything, I was literally born, you know what I mean? The club was going on when my mom, it was time for my mom to have the baby. So literally, I was born in that. And, you know what I mean? My dad had a sound called Moon Glow Sound at first. And he had the Queen Bee Club, which is in the basement of Down the Road. But also that basement was like the reception hall for weddings, christenings, you name any kind of function, people will come there and rent that space, you know what I mean, for all those type of receptions. So that's where it all started. So my dad's name is George Brightley. And Bob Elliott, who owned All Nations, him and my dad was close friends. So when Bob's first, and Bob used to be a boxer, and my dad used to be in that boxing scene as well. So when Bob said he was going to open a club, and he says, boy, George, you have to come start it off for me. So my dad actually started All Nations with Bob Everett. Because my dad had different clubs right through. So he had 007, which used to be the old Cubits. So he had 007, so he had four aces, then around the corner 007, and then came All Nations and all the other clubs. So my dad started off um, All Nations with, and we, he, he played it for years, every year, you know what I mean? He played it for a very, very long time, and then we stopped, and then I ended up going playing back there in the 80s. Uh, first generation British born being questioned by the wider society as to your Jamaicanism, what's happening in sound systems, what's happening in the tunes. And you're also being questioned by the Jamaicans in your household, your elder brother that was, you might have met when you were 15, because that was the other thing. The members of the families constantly jettisoned in to the house. They just arrived, fresh from Jamaica, with a perspective on the new dance style, the new dress sense, a strong accent. Um, new catchphrases um, so you, your sense of what a sound system is what the music is what it should be um, is constantly being challenged by all these kind of peripheral um, experiences and perspectives that you know came together actually once an event was announced um, so you have a list of artists um, that are going to appear, fresh from Jamaica. Um, you've got the DJ that's going to be uh, at the deck, and you've got the name of the sound systems, and then the wattage. And the wattage was sometimes the biggest letters on the poster because it's about the sound. Um, so, again, most of us just looked at numbers. So it'd be like <laughs> 5,000 watts. The next thing would be 10,000 watts, you know. And no one really knows what this translates to as, a, as an audio experience other than that's big, that's bigger, <laughs> that's huge, right? And so the challenge for us, um, even when going to school and attending sound systems, was relaying the experience back at school. Um, and it made no sense to some of our white friends, no sense at all. Um, because all we spoke about was bass. You know, we'd talk about the tunes and then it'd be about experience, um, uh, the experience of bass and what it did to you physically as part of that. Um, and then explain the experience of the battles that took place within a sound system. And again, 
relaying that to your schoolmates, it, it didn't quite make sense. So what? One side plays a tune, then the other side plays a tune. And then you fight. <laughs> and you go, well, yeah, if someone took a liberty and played two songs, that's disrespectful. And that would result often in a shower of bottles coming one way um, or the other. And it just didn't make sense. And, it would, and all that happens in the dark. And you go, well, that was the nature of the event. So, again, we're off, often charged with explaining an experience that, um, in the process of explaining it, you're realizing that it's, to some extent, first hand but second hand. But to us, it's real. Um, while simultaneously realizing that it's outside of the broader experience um, that is also trying to understand what's taking place in this environment. So it's quite a complex um, experience within a community that was constantly evolving. For me, I went to Jamaica with my Black Flag music and, you know, meeting all these musicians who you identified with like or you idolized now by this time i had back dennis brown delroy wilson the heptones johnny clark every single reggae artist that had come to england i'd back them with black flame anyway king toby staring around and said to me you man one of my one english man can't play reggae and i said you can't tell me that and I've backed Wally. He said, me not care on a car rig of. And by this time, I'd already played some, bought some dub plates from him, from my son. And I was so upset. I said, I'm not playing no more reggae music from Jamaica. So when I came back now, I sold all my dub plates to a son called King Tubbies, Jack Tubbies. Um, I said, I don't want this stuff anymore. I'm not playing it. And because I had to develop this new record box, by this time now, you had young British musicians making music. So you had Carol, you had Janet, you had 15, 16 and 17, and Dennis Bovell, who's older than us, but they were established as a Caribbean reggae band. And, um, and they were making the in-between music that we were, we were liking. And then it came with the point of view after tonight, all of the records. So that lined up with what we were playing. And basically, that was the beginning. And that's why when people used to say, boy, I don't want to listen to Serge House because I don't play the Lovers Rock and Soul. Well, that's what my reason was. I said, so I'm just playing British. And this is what it's all about. And that's why... And... It also represents our style. Our style, we were suave, we were smart, and the little rasta thing wasn't working because they wanted to be rough. And we're saying, we're not rough. We don't dress like that. So we literally created our own style. And I, you know what I mean? And as bad as the six men them were, they were very much instrumental in setting the standard of how we thought smart dressing was. So you went to work, you're going to take six, whatever, you find, yeah, that looks smart. And that's when, you know, man, that was that whole smart scene right up until 85 until things changed again then. And how you dance with someone you know quite well compared to how, someone you don't know. So like now, more often than not, the house parties you go to now, they're not completely random. They're people you know really well. And you might know look, most of the people in the party. And so you know that if you're in a relationship, you can only dance this way, corporate way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know and, and it's very nice and very jolly and have a nice academic Well, you talk all the way through it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, there, are lots of, there are lots of codes, aren't there? Yeah. And um, some couples agree they don't have to have that. So they're really comfortable enough with each other. Others... Um, a little bit more old school, and like there's a code, oh, whoop, and you think, oh, wow. So, um, yeah, but I still think that as a community, um, and I think it's, it is specific 
it's not even in the Caribbean. It's specific to Ca African Caribbean people. When Lovers Rock came in as well, a lot of women became a bit more independent. You find like more women are dancing together and they, you know, like, so it changes the whole social structure in terms of what men and women were about then because women were gained so much more independence. A lot of them were born here as well. So some of them are just coming to mid-teens and and 20s, so like the old tenor change, whereas we came here from the Caribbean, uh, some of us did not even know nothing about going to dance or anything like that. So I think that's one of the reasons why you'd want to sneak out to go to dance, you know what I mean? Well, first of all, there used to be always a lot of scuffles in dances for many different reasons. One would be someone stepping on someone's foot and not saying sorry, or not even knowing that they'd stepped on the foot. And, and someone be wearing quite an expensive pair of shoes and then, you know, you step on my shoes. And then a fight might ensue because of that. Or who tell you say you can dance with my girl? Or a man actually having the cheek to go up to a girl who was obviously with another man and asking her for a dance. You know, it's like, can I borrow your wife? Do you know what I mean? That, that was a no-no. And scuffles would break out because of that. Or um, two girls fighting for the attentions of, you know, one man. Or two men fighting for the attentions of one woman. And um, it was quite disruptive. So what we did was we placed um, what we called like marshals in different parts of the dance. So if any scuffle broke out, we could snub it out quickly before it, it you know, it broke into a big fire. And um, the theme of the sound system was make love and not war, because love is lovely, but war is very, 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 very ugly. And uh, we would, you know, hit on that. And then we kind of started recording um, a type of music that we decided to call Lover's Rock. And this was inviting young female singers to enter the arena, because... Um, I had noted that um, there were lots of male artists, but there were very few female artists. Um, Marcia Griffiths, one Phyllis Dillon, Hortense Ellis. I mean, you could name them, you know, apart from the eye trees, you know, Judy Mower and Rita them. You know, they, there were very few, right? Um, Lana Bennett. But then um, in England, there were practically none. I mean, um, the first female uh, that entered into the arena was a, a, a woman produced by Count Shelley, and the song was called Tenderness. And um, that, you know, made quite a stir. So which prompted me then to think of, you know, involving females in the lead role in singing, not just the backup singers, but to actually take the lead. And um, I started recording a young lady by the name of Marie Pierre. And then um, 15, 16, 17. And then Brown Sugar. And then Janet Kay. And um, from there on, Lover's Rock had a firm foot in the place. Plus, um, a lot of sound system operators had thought to make the jump from sound system to record company. So you had like Neville King was making records, D-Roy um, from Success was making records, Count Shelley was making records, and Lloydie Coxon started to make records. And um, rather than enter into a sound class with me, with my sound and his sound, he said, no, we should join forces and uh, become record producers and make records. We've got a long way to go. And um, he brought um, this young lady, Louisa Mark, and we cut um, the tune Caught You in a Lie. And that was very widely received. In fact, that was one of the first British made singles that the sound systems embraced and played. You know, all this time we weren't getting any radio play. That was our radio. So if the sound didn't play it, you know, if Coxon didn't play it, or if Drew Creed didn't play it, or Count Shelley, or um, Jim Daddy, or Quaker City, or Christopher, I'm going right up, or 
Yankee in Leeds, you know, or all the, the whole network of sound systems up and down the UK, or Tarzan in Bristol, you know, um, if they didn't play your record, it was stiff. It was no point in making it because the audience wouldn't get to hear it, wouldn't even know it was there. So, you know, that was our distribution network. And because I was in with the sound systems, I was able to do that. You know, they were, they were quite willing to listen to me, but quite a lot of people, the door was closed. Um, no, in 1978, when I was recording um, I Do Love You um, for D-Roy, D-Roy Records, and um, Dennis Bovell was the engineer in the studio, Gooseberry Studios in the West End, and uh, he said to me, I've got a song that I'd, I'd like to play you to see, you know, if you like it, maybe you'd like to record it, and I thought, oh, good, this is another one. And he played me, sang it on the guitar, Silly Games, so I said, yeah, 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 I'll do it for you. And uh, that came out, and it it did its its work in the in the community, so to speak. And it was again, it was another number one hit. And then after about six months, it just hit the pop charts, and just skyrocketed to the number two. It was the number two position, although everybody says it was the number one because it was actually number one everywhere else, and in Europe as well. Um, and even on the top of the pops, they treated me as though I had a number one because you only went on the Christmas show if you had a number one. So I actually appeared on top of the pops three times, including their Christmas show. Um, and that was the birth of my career, really. I met Leonard Chin and he had a label called Santic Records and um, he wanted to know whether I wrote my, had some original material. I sung him, I'm so sorry, he liked it. We put together a bunch of musicians and recorded the tune. And back then you could just record a tune, put it out, and it was very instant, very fast. And that was it. That was it, went to the studio. It wasn't a contract. <laughs> just, <laughs> just pure excitement and enthusiasm. And we made, made music and made a record. And it, it worked and people liked it and understood it. And um, it became a hit. But it was done here. This is our music here. It's reggae. Re Love is rock, as far as I'm concerned. When I was growing up, I didn't have reggae on the radio to listen to, so I didn't have that as a backdrop. What I had was my parents' music that they came from the Caribbean to the UK with. So I had that. I had the radio. So I would be listening to the likes of Lulu, Dusty Springfield, the Beatles, then there was all the Motown stuff that I listened to. So what came out of that for me was a mixture of my parents' music and the, the culture of music that I was brought up with here. And that mixed together for me is what made Lovers Rock because when I was singing, I wasn't thinking I'm singing a Lovers Rock song because it wasn't named. It didn't have a name. It was just my experience. I was singing my experience and my experience was Lovers Rock. It got the name later on, you know. You used to have some very good sound playing because you have a sound named Sir Goodens from Battersea, good sound. When you come to Brixton, you have Daddy Young, you have Savai, you have Jukli, you know, and Alip Safrana B, and very good so Brixton horse, the best sound system, even Count Suckle and Jukebin come to Brixton. So, when I'm not playing Barry Sound, I used to go and listen to Safrana B, or CB, the Cool Fool, or Survive, listen to do, do, them sound, you know, and hear how they play. So I developed my own style of playing. I was one of the best selectors around here in London, and I boast about it until um. I myself, Lady Coxon, I play tribute to sound in England, like um, Metro, Metro Downbeat, Duke Vin, Count Suckle, Safrana B, Neville Musical Enchanter, even Duke Reed himself, Lord Coos, Quaker City, you know what I mean, Mafia Tone, Jashaka Sound. 
great V Rocket, the only lady in the history to own a heavyweight sound in England. And such a nice lady too, you know, Miss V. Yeah, and you have Java from Labrick Grove, Count Steve, Sir Fans of the Tropical Downbeat, Sir Dees, you know. We pay a tribute to all these sound. All these sound before before I own my own sound. I used to listen to these sound. I learn a lot from these sound. People sound I learn a lot from too. So I give praises to them because they bring the, the machine to a certain stage and we come and take, take it from them and try and bring it to a next stage. You understand? But all of us is working for Jamaica music. It was different. It was, it was unique because there wasn't any other female that was um, running a sound system, you know. So people end up calling me, why go on racket? We are a lady V. So I ended up being recognized as the only female that was predominantly involved in the sound system culture in the UK um, until all of that started to filter out um, internationally. Um, so it, it, it was different and I gained a lot of respect because um, I knew my history, I knew the technical side of the sound system as well as gathering in the music. But it's always been a teamwork with the rest of the, the, the crew, with my brother, with Parliament, with Ruben. And currently now we have our siblings, which is the greatest thing for me, because it's always been a family sound that's been handed down through the generations. You know, from my mum and dad, my oldest brother, to my second eldest brother, to myself, Ruben, Parliament. And now we've got younger siblings, Selector Belly, Val B, my son, Amali, and other, other members of the family that is very much affiliated and a part of the sound. So it's, it's passing down again to the younger generation of who's been involved with it from back in the days, which is very important because a lot of the younger people now are listening to different genres of music. And when I go to my grave, I want to know that the sound system culture lives on forever. To your point, my memory of how Nzinga Sounds came to be founded was, I say, Ade being asked to, be, to, to play and me just going along to help her out. Mm. And then we just had this, I don't know, it just, we had a conversation that we're being asked so often now, mm -hmm. we have to have a name mm -hmm. and let's get our SL12s, mm -hmm. which we did. And let's get, and we didn't have speakers for a while. We hired from a company in North London. Mm -hmm. And eventually that was just got oh ridiculous. So uh, a brethren called Ken helped us and, and, and Dada helped us get some, choose some speakers. Mm -hmm. So we got our own speakers and we were totally inclusive by then. And we were just like either borrow mm -hmm. our day's brother-in-law's mm -hmm. um, estate, depending on how, what we were mm -hmm. doing, use my car. Mm -hmm. Or get delivered straight there. Or get these speakers doing a bit, but and the music would be in our cars. We didn't have a, our own yeah. van or anything. And, yeah, and I think that was because, again, being women, we were very reliant on um, the male sound systems in the early days in terms of equipment. Like, we yeah. would be called to be a guest or yeah. play at a dance. And some of the equipment, some of the situations oh. were just dire. The equipment was poor, man. It like was matchsticks and... Literally, seriously. And, and, you'd, um, have, you'd have things with tape tack. up and, you know... Mm. But then we got our own stuff and we looked mm. after it and it worked. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And I suppose that, again, forced us to, you know, um, you know there'd be challenging, challenging times. Mm. I mean, sod's law that at some point the equipment's going to fail. Yeah. And you have to be able to, you know, find out what the problem is, deal with it and sort of and sort it out and as women I found that particularly challenging that was in a packed dance you oh, know I mean it's man. almost like sometimes almost people looking at you to, to film and say well okay then what now yeah, absolutely sort it, sort it out you yeah. know the thing I regret not doing was um, talking to my brother at the moment he's doing a sound engineering course and I think that's what I would have liked to have done mm. so that when, the, when the, it didn't happen often 
but a fuse might go or something like that. And we were lucky that we'd have someone um, around, a particular brother called Ken, who would mm. help us out. But often, I mean, don't do ourselves down. Oftentimes, we had to sort it out ourselves. ourselves. That's true. That's true. Yeah, find, that is true. Find out what the, what, you know, what the, the, you know, where the weak, where the cable, where the loose cable was, or where if something had blown. Um, yeah, but I think it was about, you know, that again, for me it was about being, um, it was character building. I think it oh was God. kind of, no, you, I mean, seriously. I remember being seriously under pressure, feeling under pressure, feeling um, that people were scrutinising you. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes mm -hmm. it wasn't, we, we got some negativity from women more than... Absolutely. People yeah. would walk, they would walk into the space, it might be a birthday party, yeah. and they would look at the decks, and there might be a, a friend who was male standing beside, so they talked to him. Or it'd be like, whose records are those? Mm. Or and then what the what the best one was? They'd come up, and they would just start going through your collection. And you're standing there, you're thinking, mm. a wedding? Mm -hmm. What's going on? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, or they'd ask, and and all they'd ask you was something. Where's the DJ? <laughs> yeah, where's the DJ? But the thing for me, it was like, not can I have a look? It was literally, yeah. literally. I'm not exaggerating. Looking for your records, like mm. it's not your property. Mm. I'm, I'm, you know, yeah, yeah. My face said it all. And I'd have to tell, or and the other one, they take up the microphone. Yeah. Because yeah. the feature of us is that we don't chat. Endlessly. Yeah. yeah. We want to hear the music. We want you to hear the music, okay? Yeah. We don't need you chatting over all you sexy ladies out there, because I find it offensive, yeah? Mm -hmm. So they would take up the microphone or come and be demanding. They can chat for you. Mm. Yeah, thank you. We'll call you if we need you. So you know we didn't call them. Mm. And it was just this sense of that's how it's always been done. Mm. And as women, you're lesser than because you don't have chatting over the mic. We yeah. just wanted to play the music for people to enjoy themselves. Yeah. And in a way, that's what was that's what people liked about us. That we didn't chat over the mic mm. and drown or be cutting records off or be coming out with really other offensive or sexist comments. And, mm. and the other thing we would do is that we would vet music. So if it had profanity in it or mm. any swearing, you know, there's a there's a record shop in Maestro. Respect to Mikey. And he was saying, you won't like that record because it's got mm. swear in it, because he knew. Mm. And, and occasionally, because I was rushing, I'd buy something that would slip through, but we mm. didn't play slackness. Mm -hmm. So that era when you had a lot of slackness, you know, often mm. it was difficult. People would come and ask for it and look at you, mm -hmm. in women, as a problem because you're not playing something that was defaming or, you know, being mm -hmm. defamatory about women. I mean, I follow Sir George because... In school, one of my, my, my best friends, one of my best friends was a, a, a soul ed. So I, I used to go, I used to go soul clubs as well. I went Royal in Tottenham. I went Crackers. You know, I, I, I was, I was into music, you know, for various reasons. I liked the dancing. I liked all the, doing all the soul moves and so on, you know. <laughs> I can see, I can see you like the soul moves as well. Well, I loved, I loved soul moves. I loved, I loved, I, from time to time I went shaka, you know, did my skanking, you know. And Sir George was a beautiful sound in that they played, they, they played rare groove, you know, they played lover's rock, you know, they, they played a bit of, you know, they played your little root section as well. So they, they, they covered, they covered a lot of music that would keep me entertained. For the night, I I I went into the, the, this one one thing, you know what I mean? Because obviously, growing up in households where I came from, Saint Lucia, calypso was a thing, country and western was a thing, you know. Coming here, reggae, soul, you know. I I was I I love music, you know, as the OJ's beautifully put it, you know what I mean? So I like to go to places where I heard. A good, good selection of 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 Chris music. Parents have house parties, and you, you contribute in any way you can. Your father says, "Go and play some music, keep people entertained." So that's how I began. Early house parties with my father, people coming around playing records on the old decks and so on, the old gramophones as they were called then days. Show my age, um, and from that. After leaving school, I got my, um, met with some close friends and we formed a reggae sound system in East London called Dillinger Youth, which was uh, the younger version of Dillinger, which was a larger sound. Uh, and we were predominantly a reggae sound at that stage, playing reggae music as you did, getting really into the lovers rock of the 70s, 
um, a lot of the steppers music as they called it so we used to trace all around east london to all the haunts the reggae joints the phoebes and the club norricks um, places like that so that was my introduction into the sound system movement and then later on i, I got associated with mastermind um, and i had a grounding in reggae music but i always had a love for the soul music element uh, and, and realized there was a gap in the market where the 70s where sound systems really came to the fore it was predominantly reggae music but there was hardly any sort of specialisms around the soul music entity and i hooked up with mastermind who were in that era in that in, into that sort of genre uh, and i became involved towards the like back end of the 70s early 80s uh, and, and the rest is history as they say but when we took on that, that that element of soul music it was unique in that we became synonymous with soul sound systems we were obviously known by the reggae sound systems as if you want to hear soul go and listen to mastermind um, and the key part about our sound system was that we had a solid sound system we had all the proper speakers and we always prided ourselves on sound not noise but proper sound so you could we had the respect of all the sound, other sound systems around um, and that has always been the case you know i've never uh, and the mastermind uh, as an entity has never been into this confrontational clash who's better than who we respect every sound man every sound system and i believe we we command that respect back and i think that's the way it should be and the key part of being a sound system is about entertaining it's not about you as individual it's about giving the general public entertainment so at that time we, we began to add a different ingredient to our sound system movement by in, in, introducing like the mixing element of it so we had with the first sound system we believe in the uk to be purely soul and to also incorporate the element skills of mixing records from one to the other which was that which came out of new york came out of um, the bronx and we transformed over to the uk so we got ourselves into that and honed our skills around that and that cave gave us this unique entity of a soul sound system with the mixing element add to that the fact we were a collaborative so we were a crew of people who had specific skill sets so some of us were dancing or dancers some were mcs others were djs and we had this family of people around within mastermind and everybody loved to hear when we played out because of the way we were we did a lot of things for the first time we did things like sports and beach road parties we did um, warehouse parties and obviously carnival is where we really became very very sort of famous in inverted commas because of what we produced well the future of sound system it has it has grown remarkably all over the world it's grown um and there's been massive explosions of sound system culture in the last about i'd say maybe since 2004 or even just before because in 2004 i would say it was very poignant because a lot of um, promoters came into the business especially in europe um, so more dances were taking place. It wasn't that the sounds weren't there or weren't going anywhere, it was just that there was more promoters, which meant there was more events, which means it was being exposed more to people, it was being advertised more. So there was a big boom in those early stages. And you have loads of sounds that popped up and then, you know, some of them dwindled and, you know, it's the usual set, you know, you have an explosion, then there's a calm, then there's another explosion. So it's a whole kind of sound system kind of revive, revival kind of thing. Um, how I see it in the future, there will be many more, many more sounds, many, many more sounds um, being built. Um, I'd hope that um, it becomes a norm, you know, where venues do open their doors to sound systems again, because there is a huge demise of, of where the sounds will play anymore. Um, but the demand is so great that I thought that they will need to come and open their doors because people will demand it automatically. They want to see sound system. Um, I don't know whether there has to be a purpose-built place or something, I'm not sure. But the demand is there, it's been, it's been, sound system has been made so cool that people want to be a part of it. Um, and that's where I kind of see, I see it growing and growing, but I'm not necessarily sure if it will be a London thing. I'm not sure, 
I think it's going to go back into the way the 90s were of like these raves and underground things. It's going to go underground, then it's going to come back again, you know, because that's what happened then. And that's what I think this is what's going to happen now. We're in that stage of where there's a, a little quiet. People are going to go out of London to hear sound systems play because we're, we, we have open doors there. We can go into all of these venues outside of London, but here it's so difficult. Abroad, great things. You have a lot of festivals. You have Rotatom, you have Reggae Gill, you have um, so many, you have Irie Vibes. You have so many massive festivals in Europe now got taking place that always have a sound system corner, which is, which is always, always the most popular corner. Everybody loves the sound system corner. We have three or four sounds set up which is great because you're, you're having thousands and thousands of people being exposed to sound system. You know, at the last Reggae Guild there was, they said 90,000 people, you know, that attended that festival on that weekend and they were exposed to sound system culture. So that shows you how poignant it is and that how the demand is there for reggae music, you know. Reggae music is, it will always stand firm and be held highly, you know. We just kind of need that more in the UK. Otherwise, we'll be working abroad the majority of our lives. Throughout this whole period, it's important to say that you did not find um, Jamaican music, is the best way of putting it, I think, as a regular feature on mainstream radio. And there's a history that goes all the way back, um, uh, but mainly that history, I would say, involves the BBC and the BBC's take on black music in general. Um, and, you know, we can go back as far as Radio Caroline as a good example of how that works because Radio Caroline was one of the first major pirate stations on a boat um, off the coast. Um, and at one point, to cut a long story short, it's attracting in excess of 20 million as an audience. And the BBC looks at that and goes, they're not legal. But more importantly, that's an audience we should have. Close them down. And within the space of, I think, a year, 18 months, Radio Caroline was closed. The laws have changed around piracy. And they hire in the main DJs from the pirate station to play a similar mix of black music and popular pop music on the stations, which became Radio 1. Radio 1, because it's now headed up by individuals actually had a preference for R&B and soul, still didn't play reggae, which meant that enterprising individuals who wanted the music on air had to develop their own stations. And this came in the form of pirate uh, stations in the UK, which, again, were local, because, well, they just couldn't transmit further than local, but it reflected local sounds and central to many of the pirate stations was a sound system. So you got a selection or DJs associated with a sound system. Um, and it was also back in the day where um, you had a cassette recorder and you spent half the evening like this, poised to press record and play uh, to capture a tune. Um, and you built up your own collection of um, broadcasts on these cassettes that enticed you to go to the event and listen to the, the full experience of those records at sound systems. So pirate stations have been integral to maintaining or communicating or connecting and maintaining that connection with an audience. Um, and as we move from the 70s into the early stations, um, it didn't improve. Pirate stations, uh, when I say didn't improve, the availability of reggae on radio didn't approve, uh, improve. What you had was when we hit the 80s, these um, blue-eyed versions, if you like, um, of ska and reggae, they made the mainstream radio. But that further suppressed music that was born out of the black community. Um, so whilst one might argue reggae was on Radio 1. It came in the form of the police. It came in the form of UB40. And with all due respect, um, you didn't find black reggae artists having the same amount of exposure. And that follows through to the press 
as well. So you've got pirate radio and you've got press. And what's important to understand is the dynamic relationship between printed press back in the day and radio. If the press wrote about you as being potentially viable, um, you, the record sounds fantastic, it's going to chart, that would give the confidence to the radio DJ to program the record. So if you didn't get the press, you're unlikely to get um, uh, the radio support. And if you didn't get the radio support, there's no way you're going to end up on top of the pops. And so there's this circle of media that needed to operate in your favour for you to be exposed. So we were not part of that circle. And that, again, suppressed um, the sound systems or, again, you could flip the script and said, made sound systems more viable. But by the time we get to the 80s, that relationship to the music came via pirate radio. Um, and the pirate radios um, are still here today in various forms, but pirate radio, radio has remained an integral part of the communication platform or mechanism for sound systems. I mean, I stopped playing sound about 1974. 75 because I became more interested in live music you know and actually recording in studios and because I'd had the knowledge of hearing what sound systems sound like loud in the studio I was able to reach for those frequencies and stamp them there you know like for instance there's times in the studio when you have to believe in your ears and disbelieve your eyes because your eyes will tell you it's in the red, right? And not supposed to be there. But your ears will tell you it's in the red and it's felt nice, it's nice, it's nice, leave it there. You know, so we used to have lots of arguments with um, technicians in the studio because they go, no, no, that's distorted. So, Can you hear it being distorted? No, but the, the meter says it is. So I said, well, mate, this is ears versus eyes and ears win. This is a sound, not a TV. I think that tradition of performance, of putting on stuff that, that says to other people, you can't categorize me, I am, I'm going to take my revenge on you, you know, We're, with other people that are subdued. I think it was C.L.R. James that said, um, Jamaicans are not necessarily revolutionary, but they're definitely rebellious. And that, that tradition has been part, you know, of who we are for an awfully long time. And I think it's one of the reasons that, um, that's how people sort of keep your sanity. So even if what you're doing is sweeping in during the day, at night you're working at a dance hall. And that, that matters, you know, a huge amount. Thing, you know. And it's one message I always have for the youth. Yes, sound system is a very nice thing, but if you want to be interested in sound system, try and go to the college and gain a qualification first. So you have something to fall back on because it's not everybody going to make it in the sound system. It's a one rugged business. Sound system is an expensive hobby. You spend more than what you receive most of the time, you know what I mean? The only time sound system man can say you make a money unless you keep your own show. Most of the time it's like you're you buying two, three hundred pounds a record to go and play in a, a Birmingham when you go up there, it's a problem. You don't even get two hundred pounds. So you understand, you're spending to do this thing and it's not coming back. So you, you have the skill to, to work it. And um, to be a great sound, you have to have music. It, it's, it's not just a show-off thing or a talk. If you talk big, you have to play big. And if you're humble, you can get away with it. You know what I mean? So um, music and entertainment. The whole thing comes down to the end, end product of it is about entertaining people who pay £10 or £20 to come and listen to you. They want to be entertained for that money. You can't shortchange them. You know what I mean? You have to give people proper entertainment. Your microphone man has to be saying the right thing. And you know, because a lot of people try and bring the sound thing in, in disrespect. But the reason why 
you keep people keep mixing up radio selector with sound system. Sound system is a different thing from radio thing, you know. And it's a different thing from disco. Sound system is a unique thing. Sound system is like a library, you know. People go to the library to do what? Read good books. And when people come to the sound system, they come to hear good music with the behavior pattern and everything with it. You understand? So, you know, because the show that you're playing tonight, it's sell the next one that you go the next week. But discipline, you know? If you don't have discipline doing it, you're going to fall in trouble, problem. You must have a dis whatever you do around the music thing, you must have proper discipline. You know what I mean? <laughs>